In section 2.5, we've been solving systems of equations in context. We're going to continue that with a different type of variety of problems. So we're going to go ahead and write down the I can statement. I can solve perimeter and distance problems. Distance problems right here. And let's go through the warm-up just to remind us of a few things. How do you find the perimeter of a geometric shape? So if we had a rectangle, say, and we had something like this, how would we find the perimeter? Well, the perimeter is the distance around the outside. So what we do is we add up all the outsides. So add up all the sides. Add up all the sides. And if a rectangle has a length and a width, what's the formula for the perimeter? So I'm going to say that this is L, and this is L, and this is W, and this is W. So if we were to add all of those up, I'd have an L plus a W plus an L plus a W. So if I write those down, it looks like this. And that's a little bit of a silly way to write that, because I could just say, well, the perimeter is going to be two lengths, so 2 times L plus 2 times W. That's probably the simplest way to write it. We could write it like this. But that's probably the simplest way to write it right there. Uh, the perimeter equals two lengths plus two widths. Uh, what's the formula for, for the perimeter of a circle? And what special name do we give it? Remember, if we've got a circle, the perimeter is still the distance around the outside. It's just that there aren't really any straight sides or anything. If we took a string and stretched it around the outside, that would be the perimeter. Um, so with a special name for that is called the circumference. Circumference. And you might remember the formula. I think we've talked about this already. The formula is 2 times pi times r. Remember, don't confuse that with pi r squared. Pi r squared is the formula for the area of a circle. We don't want to make that mistake. So there's the formula for the perimeter of a circle, the circumference. And if you went 50 miles per hour for four hours, how, how far would you go? Well, if we went 50 miles per hour, that means every hour we go 50 miles. So in an hour, we'd go 50 miles. In the second hour, we'd go another, another 50. So that would be 100 miles altogether. So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take that speed that we're going, and we're going to multiply it by how, how long we went that far, and um, or how, that, how far we went that fast, and we'd end up going 200 miles. Well, if you, if, whether you've heard this or not, you, I'm hoping that you're familiar with this formula right here. This is d equals rt. And we actually used this formula uh, in order to figure out the answer. So what we did is we figured out, because it said, how far would you go? Well, that's a distance. What we did is we took the rate, or the speed, and we multiplied it by the time. So 50 times 4 is 200 miles. And that's what this is. Distance equals rate times time. You might want to remember that. Um, and this one says solve this for r. So if we're going to solve this for r, what we do is we would divide by t. And we get r is equal to the distance divided by the time. And that might come in handy. We mentioned when we were solving uh, formulas, sometimes it's helpful to have one variable by itself as opposed to another. So in this one, uh, d equals rt, distance equals rate times time. That's really handy if they give us how fast we're going uh, and for how long we're going to go that fast. But if they were to say, tell us how far we went and how long it took, we could figure out the speed. Like, let's say we went 280 miles, and we did that in seven hours or something like that, so in seven hours. What we could do is we could say, all right, well, the rate is going to be how far we went, 280 miles. And I'm going to go ahead and put the units on there. And then the time is seven hours. So if we go ahead and do the division, that's going to be 40 miles per hour. So that's how those formulas can come in handy. Now, um, the instructions for these are very similar to the ones that we've done in the past. Each one of these has a slightly different flavor. What we want to do is we want to get used to all these different types of problems that we can solve now that we know how to solve a system of equations. So the instructions for this say, write equations for each problem. Be sure to define the variables. And then solve the problems and state what the answer is. This stating what the answer is is really important because just because you can do the math doesn't mean that you know what parts of the answer mean what in the real problem. We want to make sure everybody knows we know exactly what we're doing with these. So it says the perimeter of a rectangle is 44 centimeters. The length of the rectangle is two more than three times the width. Find the length and the width of the rectangle. And then in the box here, I've got a little hint. It says, since this is about a geometric shape, what should we do first? Well, if it's about a geometric shape, we probably ought to draw a picture. So draw a picture. So I'm just going to write draw a pic. And we probably ought to draw a rectangle here. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a rectangle, kind of like what we did up above. And let's label the features here. So we've got a length and we've got a width. Now. 
we do know that the perimeter of this is 44 centimeters. So the perimeter would be two lengths plus two widths, all right? And it says the length of a rectangle is two centimeters more than three times the width. So this length here, it's quite a bit bigger. In fact, if we take three times the width and then we add two to that, two more would mean we're gonna add, um, that would be the length. So if we take three times the width and we add, uh, let's see, add two, um, that would be the length. Now, I've, I've got actually an equation with three variables here, but they did tell us what the perimeter is. So we could just say, well, 44 is equal to two lengths plus two widths. And then we know that the length is equal to three widths plus two. Now, once we have this, Let's pause for a second, take a deep breath and say, okay, what's going on here? Remember, this is about the perimeter. A lot of times when we have story problems, especially with systems of equations, we're gonna have two equations about two completely different things. This one is about the perimeter. The perimeter is 44 and the perimeter is two lengths plus two widths. This one is about the relationship between the length and width. How big is the length compared to the width and vice versa? So now that we've got those two equations, we're ready to solve this and we can almost forget about the original problem and just say, okay, I know I can solve this with uh, graphing. I know I can solve it with substitution. I can solve it with elimination. What's the best technique for this particular one? Well, if you take a look at this, even though we like uh, elimination really well, and that's probably our favorite technique, this one is actually set up for substitution. So let's solve this by substitution. Wherever there's a length, we can put what it equals. It equals three widths plus two. So we're gonna take this and we're gonna plug it in right here. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and write this down and I want you to stop and think. I'm gonna put a two here and then I'm gonna put two W right here. There's something very important when we do substitution. Please never forget this because if you forget this, you're gonna make a mistake. So if I just write three W plus two, we're gonna be multiplying two times three, we're gonna get a six and we're gonna forget that this entire thing represents what the length is. We've gotta make sure that we distribute. So if we do this, we've now got an equation with one variable, we can solve that. It does have some simplifying that we need to do, but let's go ahead and do that. So we're gonna go ahead and distribute through. So we get 44 equals six W plus four, and then this is plus two. Double check and make sure that we did all that right. Yep, six W plus four, and then we've got plus two W. So this is going to be 44 equals, this is gonna be eight W plus four. We're gonna go ahead and subtract the four, so we get 40 equals eight W, and then we're gonna divide both sides by eight, and here's what we get. We get W equals, let's see, 40 divided by eight is five. So we're gonna go ahead and circle that, that's part of the answer. Now we're gonna take this, and we're gonna figure out what the length is. So I'm gonna take this, and I'm gonna plug it in right here. You'll notice that this falls in line with exactly how we were doing substitution before. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug this in, and I get L equals, equals three times W, and remember W is five, plus two. So that's gonna be 15 plus two. So that means L is equal to 17, and I'm gonna put a dotted circle around that. Now we've solved the entire problem. We think we have the answer. So let's write this down. But before we write this down, let's just double check and make sure that this actually works. So we think the length on this one is 17 and we think the width is five. If you were to add those together, those two together make 22. These other two together would also make 22, and if you add those together, we get 44. You could, of course, just go through and say, okay, if that's 17, that's 17, and that would be five, and then we'd have seven plus five is 22, seven, or sorry, 17 plus five is 22, 17 plus five is 22, add those together. Any way you look at it, we did get this right. So now we wanna write down what the answer. We just wanna say the length is 17 and we want to say the width so width is five and we'll circle that and we're all set to go now i do just want to caution you on one thing a lot of people get hung up on the fact that they think the length always has to be bigger than the width that's not always the case what's important in fact in fact it would be better if we just called these the dimensions of the uh the rectangle that might be a little bit better then we don't get hung up on the fact that we think the length has to be longer than the width 
Okay, let's take a look at the next one. It says Jonathan can row 36 kilometers downstream in three hours, but it takes him six hours to row the same distance upstream. It says find the rate of his rowing and the rate of the current. So we've got two things missing here. We don't know how fast Jonathan can row, and we also don't know the speed of the current uh, in whatever stream that he's in or river that he's in. So um, here's what we've got to do on this one. This is why we're talking about distance problems in this particular one. We need to use this formula in some fashion. Um, this information right here, if we know he can go 36 kilometers downstream in three hours, we actually know how fast he can go. So downstream, he can actually go 36 kilometers in three hours. So he can actually do, go 12 kilometers per hour. That's how fast he can go. Now, that's both the speed of his uh, rowing and the speed of the current together. Um, we did a problem similar to this uh, a couple of days ago. Okay, upstream, um, he can only go, let's see, the same distance, so that's 36, um, and it takes him six hours. So he can only go six kilometers per hour. And then it says we want to find the speed of his rowing and the speed of the current. And I mentioned this before, but this just kind of brings this to light again because you will see lots of problems like this. It says with problems involving current or wind, this particular one is about current, we've got to put the variables representing the speed in the correct order. So again, there are two things that are uh, contributing to Jonathan's speed downstream, how fast he can row and how fast the current is. So downstream, it would be rowing plus the current would equal his total speed of 12 kilometers per hour. And then going upstream, he has to row against the current. So it actually subtracts from his speed and that's gonna be that six kilometers per hour. And then we can go ahead and solve this. And you can see that this one is clearly set up for elimination. Those are gonna go away. We get two R equals 18, so we get R equals nine. Once we have that, we can plug that in and we can figure out what the current is. So we're gonna plug that in right here. This would be nine plus C equals 12. It's almost like you don't have to do any work on this one because you can tell that C's gotta be equal to three. So I'm gonna put a circle around each one of those and then we're gonna write down what the answer is. Um, we're gonna say he can row nine kilometers per hour and then we're gonna say current is three kilometers per hour. And that's what we'd circle. Now, this is the answer that we want everybody to look at. This is what makes it clear that we know exactly what we're doing. And here's all of the supporting work. We used this little formula. We figured out, gosh, if he can go 36 kilometers down, uh, downstream in three hours, that means he's, his total speed is gonna be 12 kilometers per hour. We wrote this little uh, equation right here about downstream, another equation about upstream, and so forth. So all the supporting work here, and then here's the interpretation, the, the, what the numbers mean in the context of the problem. And again, keep this in mind, it's the speed of the object plus or minus the speed of the current or the wind, and that's gonna come in handy on the next one. So let's take a look at this next one right here. This one is about a jet. It says a jet flies four hours with a 60 mile per hour tailwind. So in this case, it's telling us how fast the wind is going. It's telling us how much the speed of that aircraft is being aided by the wind. And then it says the return trip against the same wind takes five hours. Find the speed of the jet with no wind. So they just wanna know how fast is the jet capable of, of flying if there was no wind. And it says, hint, um, what do you know about the distance for the trip there and the trip back? Well, if it goes someplace and then it goes right back, those distances would be exactly the same, all right? So we're gonna do with and against the wind. And this is where it's important to keep this in mind. We don't know the speed of the aircraft. So if we don't know the speed of the aircraft, I'm just gonna use P for plane, or if you wanna do X or whatever, that would be totally okay. So with the wind, here's what happens. Um, it's gonna be the speed of the plane plus that 60 mile per hour wind. And then it did that for four hours. So we're gonna take that and we're gonna multiply it by four. Now, what do, what do we do with this? What do we set it equal to? Well, keep in mind that distance equals rate times time. This is the speed and this is the time and that equals the distance. So here's what I'm gonna do. It really wouldn't matter if I did D on this side or equals D on this side. We don't know what the distance is and that's really not a big problem here because we've still got two variables and we're okay with having two variables. Now, when he goes against the wind or when this plane goes against the wind, this is going to be the plane minus the 60 mile per hour wind because now it's gonna be a headwind. It's gonna subtract from how fast the plane's actually going and it's gonna take them five hours. 
Now, again, if you wanted to write equals D on this side and equals D there, that would be totally okay. But it is kind of nice to kind of keep it in this format right here. D equals RT, distance equals rate times time. If you haven't seen that before or don't have that locked away in your memory, it's kind of like those formulas for the circumference or circ uh, formula for area and things like that. You want to make sure that you lock that away. Uh, I think we did uh, a problem using an interest formula. Simple interest is also a formula that you want to lock away and be able to recall at a moment's notice. So here's what we've got. And you'll notice something about this. This is set up for substitution. Wherever there's a D, we can put this stuff right here. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to plug this in right here. So this is going to be, and I'm going to, forgive me, I'm going to rewrite this just a little bit. I'm going to do 4 uh, times P plus 60 equals 5 times P minus 60. And you'll notice that, again, we've got some simplifying to do on each side. So this is going to be 4P plus, this is going to be 240. This is going to be 5P minus, uh, let's see, what do we have here, 300. Yep, that looks good. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and solve. I'm going to get the variable on one side first, so I'm going to move the smallest one. I'm going to subtract the 4p. Uh, that means if the variable is going to end up over on this right-hand side, we might as, well, might as well move that 300 over there. So we're going to add 300. Um, and that's going to give us p on this side. And that's going to give us 540 over on this side. And that's the answer. Now, you'll notice that the question here said, find the speed of the jet with no wind. We actually don't have to find the distance that it traveled. We could do that if we wanted to, and if a problem said that we needed to, we definitely would. The answer on this problem is we can just say something like this. Um, jet can go, whoops, can go 540 miles per hour. Okay, that's how fast the jet is capable of going, and that's a pretty typical commercial uh, aircraft jet speed. Now, if, it, if we did need to go back and figure out what was the actual distance that this traveled, we could take this and we could plug it in over here. So if we were to plug this in, this would be 540 plus 60. So 540 plus 60, so that's going to be 600. So we'd have 600 times 4, that's going to be 2,400 miles. So that would be the total distance that it traveled. And if we checked it on this one right here, this would be um, 540 minus... So 540 minus 60, that's going to be 480 times 5. Now, that one's not quite as easy because it's not in our, I don't have my 48 times tables memorized. So I'm going to bring up a calculator. Just double check that. Gosh, I, I bet it's 2400. And just kind of thinking about it this way, this is uh, 5 is kind of, if we thought of that as a 0.5, half of 20, uh, 48 is uh, 24. So I'm thinking we're going to be okay on this one. 48 times 5 we end up with 2,400. So it definitely works here. Um, we did get that right. Um, and again, I encourage you to do a lot of these problems so you can get a sense of how these different problems work. They all kind of contain the same principles. Again, we're writing two equations about really two different things, with the wind, against the wind, downstream, upstream, um, you know, how much the bead costs versus the total, uh, total price or something like that. Um, anyway, uh, good luck with these. This is the last of these type of problems, but we are going to be applying these in many different situations. So if you need uh, some extra help, please ask for it. Thanks.